It's great to see everybody come out. This is an amazing event. We have Whitney Wolf Heard and Katrina Lake. Uh, we're going to do a fireside chat, and then we'll do about 20 minutes or so of Q&A. Just a couple of people I want to thank. I want to thank the Bumble team, uh, Caroline, uh, Sam, and Laura, for all the work you all put into making this event happen. And then this is a co-sponsored event with the Entrepreneurship Club and Rama. Spent so much time on this, so thank you. <laughs> And with Wim and Samina, who's going to be coming out in a second. I mean, there was a lot that went in behind the scenes. Uh, but most of all, I want to thank uh, Whitney and Katrina for taking time out of their schedule to be with us today. Uh, every time I hear either one of them speak, I get so inspired. And uh, Whitney was in class today, and it was amazing. So really looking forward to today. And with that, I'll introduce Samina, who's going to give the bios of our guests. Hi, everyone. Whitney Wolf Heard is a founder and CEO of Bumble, the parent company that operates Badu, Fruits, and Bumble, three of the world's fastest growing dating apps worldwide. In 2014, Wolf Heard launched Bumble to challenge the antiquated rules of dating and create a space where people can find healthy and equitable relationships. Bumble is the only dating app where women make the first move. The company launched Bumble BFF in 2016 for friendship finding and launched Bumble Biz for professional networking in 2017. In January 2020, Wolf Heard welcomed Blackstone as Bumble's new majority owner with a shared vision of growth for Badu and Bumble. In 2021, Wolf Heard led Bumble's IPO as the youngest woman ever to take a company public. Wolf Heard has previously been named to Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, Forbes 30 Under 30, the Bloomberg 50, and in Style's 50 Women Who Are Changing the World. She's been featured on the cover of Fast Company, Forbes, and Wire. And in 2021, Bumble was named as one of Apple's apps of the year. She's currently on the um, board of directors of Imagine Entertainment and on the executive board of her alma mater, SMU. Please join me in welcoming Whitney Wolford. Moderating this fireside chat, we have Katrina Lake, a dear friend of Whitney, Stanford, and WIM. Many of you may recognize Katrina, who was a keynote speaker at WIM's banquet last year. We are so happy to have her back. Katrina is a successful entrepreneur, best known as the founder and CEO of Stitch Fix, an online personal styling service revolutionizing the way people shop. Lake founded Stitch Fix in 2011 and took the company public in 2017 at age 34. It's not often we have two successful entrepreneurs on the stage at once, let alone two trailblazing women who also happen to both be friends, partners, and mothers. Please join me in welcoming Katrina. All right, hi everybody. It's great to be back, and it's great to welcome Whitney. We were just talking about Stanford. She was asking me what years I was here, and um, I feel like this is like my happiest place on earth. So I'm very happy to be here, and very happy to be here with Whitney. Very Whitney and I are here. good friends. We were just <laughs> talking about how we need to have some cocktails and talk about our kids in the public markets and <laughs> <laughs> all that good stuff. Um, and it's really, it's meant so much to me. Um, a lot of this job as an entrepreneur, as a public company CEO is, um, it's really hard. And to be able to have somebody like Whitney to be able to call and cry to and like text late at night and complain to has like meant the world to me. So I feel really just appreciative to have you in my life, Whitney. Thank you. Well, I feel the same way about you. So could Katrina, when we were going public, was so incredibly supportive, so helpful, so inspiring. You know, she kind of passed the baton to me, and you were just so warm and welcoming. And I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate how these bonds behind these companies really um, keep us afloat, right? And so everything you said, thank you, I echo that. And very excited to be here. I did not and would never have gotten into Stanford, so this is a very important day for me. Um, unlike Katrina, who was very much a student here. But thank you for having us. 
many, many years ago. All right, um, I have this list of questions. Whitney just said I can ask her anything, so. Get after it. <laughs> so I'll try to stick to the script, and we will have time for Q&A later, so definitely kind of noodle on questions that you might have. Um, I mean, maybe at a high level, I think like, you know, both of us have had a lot of challenging moments and I think resilience is, you know, one of the attributes that helps entrepreneurs to get to where we are. And so maybe it'd be helpful to kind of share a couple of those moments of what were some of the hard ones and what was kind of the resilience that got you through it. Yeah, no, I think you know better than anybody what goes into <clears throat> getting a company to where we've gotten our businesses to today. And there are more lows than highs candidly, as you know, um, and but what really keeps us going, I think, is our mission and our customers and our teams. Uh, you know, when you and I spoke, when I was going public, you had so much good insight and so much, um, you know, kind of great advice, and you just said, keep that game time spirit, like keep your team happy, just make sure your team feels supported, and I think that has been fuel for me too when there's days I'm like, I'm out of here, what am I doing? I can't. Um, then I just think about everybody else and the, you know, the people we're serving and, and you just take a deep breath, right? You have three little boys. I don't know how you do that. I have two little boys and I'm confused how I'm doing that. So Also our boys are friends. Yeah, it's really cute. We're all about Bobby it's this week. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cute. Um, we still have one of Bobby's trucks, actually. Oh, you do? We need to return it, yeah. Oh, wow. That's very good parenting, <laughs> by the way. Like, holding them accountable. I like it. Um, no, but I think, you know, how have you done it? I mean, it's like we just kind of go day by day, right? I mean, it's the only way you can do it. One foot in front of the next. Um, I mean, maybe that's not on the list, but I mean, I'd love to hear just what your you know, being a CEO is such a lonely job. And to your point, there are so many times when you have to get the team, you, you want the team to be focused, and the team to be optimistic, and the team to be in one place while your head can be in another. Like how, like, how do you navigate that element of the job that can be so lonely? Yeah. Well, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I actually do equate it to parenting. It's very similar. There's days when you're parenting and you don't have the answers. Um, you too want to go take a nap and you know, you're very stressed, but you have to kind of put a brave face on and think um, about how you're showing up for, you know, in that instance, children, but in our teams for everybody else. And so there have been so many days where I didn't know if we were gonna make it through. You know, some crazy thing comes out of left field and candidly, I'm terrified in that moment or I don't know the right answer, but I think, um, kind of just taking a deep breath and reminding ourselves like, you know, what can go well from here? Like how do we just find our way out of this? And you know, you and I were just talking about this. It's like, there's always a way out. There's always a path through. And yeah. so I think just focusing on, you know, what are the solutions? Like what's the, you know, choice A and choice B to get out of here? Yeah. Um, Maybe one question around just like, you know, both of us um, were raising money at a time that unfortunately is still true, where I think it was, you know, much more difficult for women to raise money than men. And the dynamics, um, unfortunately, haven't shifted a lot. I think even last year, the data I have here is that um, women were still only 1.9% of overall funding um, last year, which is, you know, the year 2022. Um, so, you know, in what ways... You know, in what ways do you feel like the, the dynamic is, I don't know, what is my right question here? Like, it's super disappointing, obviously. Like, what are some of the things that you feel like are disappointing about it? And maybe on the flip side, like, what are some of the things that, like, give you optimism, give you hope, like, you know, kind of help us to, I don't know, see the bigger picture yeah. and be able to not be so sad about that? It, well, it is scary when you look at the statistics. Uh, another scary statistic is that you were the youngest woman to ever take a company public. You waited several years. And then I became the youngest woman to ever take a pump company public. And I'm still waiting to do what you did, which was kind of pass the torch. And it makes me sad that I'm still waiting. I'm like, where is that next woman that I can say, you Maybe know, right I, here in this yeah, room. Probably, most likely. Um, and so, like, hurry up. Come on, guys. Let's this <laughs> um, uh, I, I do think that that's just a testament to where we're at. Like, things are moving um, slower than we would like. I do think that there is a shifting narrative around the woman customer. 
and that means money is going to change. I think for the first time in my career, I've seen people start to kind of raise the flag on women's health matters, and um, fertility is a really challenging journey for so many women, oh, and the menopause market. So mm -hmm. there's all these markets that people are like discovering, but you know they've all been <laughs> here in front of our face. And so I think this is kind of what happened to me with Bumble, it's like, I said, ooh, women in dating, like we matter too. And that was like a shocking discovery. Like we had like discovered some rare earth mineral. And you know, I think that, that the more that this starts to shift, the more money should start to change hands. So I'm hopeful that with the emergence of like femtech and kind of all of um, the needs around the woman customer will hopefully diversify, you know, money going to those products and candidly it's businesses like yours and like mine that that set the stage for investors too oh wow there was money you know I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many investors texted me the day um, we were going public saying hey like how do I get in on your um, DSP or like do you know be able to get in before the thing happens I said um believe in me three and a half years ago when I told you about this idea and you didn't think it was good. That's how. So, you know, I think that you, we just have to have more positive examples as well. Yeah. And that's a good segue to like, I used to have journalists who um, like told me, I was like, is this a compliment? They would be like, oh, you know, I would ask people like, which company did you totally miss on? And like the one that I heard most often was Stitch Fix. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So <laughs> wow. the company most passed on out there. But, um, oh, no. <laughs> but I mean, That's but it's interesting. Example, but in some ways it's interesting because you say also that you were underestimated. People didn't see it. And so like, you know, many people in this room may end up becoming investors. Like what advice do you have for that? Um, think different, right? We have to challenge the way we see something in order to actually be willing to see it, if that made any sense. That was like a weird riddle that was not supposed to happen that way. <laughs> but the point is, like, you know, if we just look at everything that came before, there's no way to see anything beyond that. And so I think Bumble was an example of that because there were so many dating apps out there. And everyone was like, this market's too saturated. There's no way. How could it? But we were looking at the woman's view, the woman's lens. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more we kind of chase the feminine, just from a tech standpoint, right? It's been such a, um, it's just been such a, I don't even mean male dominated just in terms of workforce or in terms of capital. I think the products, the consumer brands themselves have been so oriented um, just without even thinking about a broader lens or inclusivity or diversity and I think the more we can kind of bridge that gap I think the the environment will change yeah totally and I would extend that yeah I think and you just said it too around like it's I think it, there are so many groups that are underrepresented in terms of decision makers and I think any place that like there's an advantage in being able to have a better pulse on what people want and have a better pulse on the true demographics mm -hmm. of who consumers are and yeah. so um, hopefully we'll see more of that come to life. I do think though, leaning into being underestimated can actually be so, so, so beneficial. Um, it gives you the opportunity to kind of like fly under the radar. Competitors don't put spend into, you know, stifling your growth and people aren't watching you. And when you're not being watched and you're not being, you know, kind of analyzed, then you get to just run. And I think that that was something that probably happened to you as well, but with, with us, people kind of just laughed at us for so long that I don't think they saw us as a real threat. And by the time we were a visible threat, it was the horse had left the barn, it was just too late. <laughs> and so I think there is something about being underestimated and I like it. I actually think it's, it's great and it gives you something, I don't wanna say oh, operate to prove people wrong, and that's not, that's not the point, but it, it does drive me on a personal level. Mm -hmm. When people tell me no, I'm like, oh, really? And so it's, it's like motivating, you know? It's exciting to go and do it differently. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of visible, maybe um, like going public, like how, how did you arrive at the decision to go public? How has that journey been? Um, what, how have things changed since being public? Um, I could ask you the same thing. <laughs> uh, I think you and I probably arrived at the decision to go public in similar ways, I would assume. I think when you scale a company to a certain point of revenue and to a certain growth rate, 
you know, you've got very few choices, right? As you and I were discussing, it's like, do you raise more money? Do you sell some of the company? Or do you bring the public along in your journey? And for me, on a personal level, I was just saying this in um, Graham's class before this, that I think it's exciting to be able to invite the customer along with your company, mm -hmm. right? Not just to like be a member of Bumble, which by the way, I'm gonna poll this room. I hope everybody here either is on Bumble or will be in the next hour. <laughs> um, so that's an expectation I have here. Uh, but I, I think it's exciting to bring the public along on your journey. I mean, if people, I, I, this is so funny. W the year we went public, we went public on the 11th, so just shy of Valentine's Day, we saw all of these tweets of people saying like, I don't want chocolates this year for Valentine's Day, I want Bumble stock. And it was like for the people that they had met on Bumble. And so I just thought that was cute that you know anybody can be involved um, and be a part of the entrepreneurial journey to some degree. I thought that was exciting. Yeah. But I don't know if I feel the same way two years later. <laughs> <laughs> right, so what are some of the downsides? What are hard? I mean, we could talk about this for the whole hour, so you don't need to list all the things. But. Um, I think you know very well, you know, ramping up for earnings calls every 90 days is um, it's just a week of your life that you don't get to focus on the company. And meetings that you really wanted to have about new product or um, new marketing initiatives or whatever you've got going on, like, those have to get pushed, and you have to just like get so focused and so um, in the zone. So there's something exciting about that, and I kind of love it. But then on the flip side, it is um, you know it's just this beat that like kind of controls your cadence a bit. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah, feel? Yeah. yeah, I think it's and I I mean I also think that like what you said earlier around like you know when you're under the radar and you can just like run. I miss that a little bit too yeah. because I think it's harder. There are a lot of ways in which it's harder to take risks when you're public. That um, it's not impossible, but it's just harder. You can bring your investors along, and you can do all those things. But um, you know, there's some of it is regulatory, and some of it is actually just like you're making commitments every single quarter on what you're what you're going to do. And um, and you know, innovation doesn't kind of move at a super predictable quarterly pace. So I yeah, agree with that. no, for sure. And there's not a lot of room for anything to go wrong. Like wars breaking out or all of these circumstances that pandemics, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many macro, um, you know, factors that I think that's another thing for us to worry about at night. And yeah. that, that becomes probably more stressful in a public company than in a private one. Yeah. And how have you found just kind of leading a company in this year where, in the last, I mean, what, four years, right? Where suddenly in the workplace we're talking about racial justice, we're talking about, um, I mean, we're talking about women's rights, we're talking about um, war, we're yeah. talking about, you know, people's health and safety with COVID. Like, what, how has this leadership journey been over the last four years? Uh, I would years, say that years? every year has its own crazy curveball, right? Um, but I think for me, I am trying to see all of these circumstances as opportunities for growth, right? That's, you can either be stressed out by it all and underwater, or you can be like, oh, it's another big wave. Like, let's just figure out how to ride it and make it work and keep everyone safe and happy. So that's the only perspective shift I, I, I can really think of that will make this exciting and invigorating and a growth opportunity versus just getting hit by something new every single day. And so I, I really think I've tried to just train myself on perspective because whether it's COVID or the Ukraine war or if it's, um, you know, even on a more granular level with our business, the very unfortunate reality of being in a business that connects people is for every amazing success story we have, you read something that makes you sick. And that you know, could quite literally bring me to my knees every day, or I can say, okay, here's a learning, here's a new product feature we can engineer to prevent this particular situation from happening again. So almost like using the, the tragic moments, macro or granular, you know, kind of as it pertains just to our business, as moments for innovation and for doing things better and progressing. Yep, that's all you can do. <laughs> Love it. Um, 
And maybe just in terms of just like Bumble, one of the things that I've loved about Bumble is I feel like it's um, like it's not just an app. I feel like it's a brand and it means something. And I love that it also, I feel like beyond just, you know, kind of connections and dating, that it's also like stood for female friendship. And I feel like in some ways it's kind of like I see it as an extension of your personality. But like, I mean, can you talk a little bit about just, uh, you know, how, yeah, like how you think about Bumble as a brand, how you think about how, like, you know, how you can bring it to life you know, in terms of like a mission and something that people wake up for every day that's not just about, you know, kind of like the you know, tactical one yeah. thing in the app, right? Um, well, and I feel that about Stitch Fix with you. It's Thanks. interesting. <laughs> I think there really is DNA from founders, founding teams, the people that are so intimately involved in birthing these products. You kind of can see, you know, it's almost like, you know, they say dogs start to look like they're owners, it's like these products start to kind of morph into whoever is leading them. And so I try to, when we're you know doing our brand building and when we're launching BFF or when we're launching these new initiatives, I really do try to put an extreme emphasis with the creative teams behind it to be very careful about how it's showing up in the world. Is it kind connections? Is it our mission? Is it our values? Because um, Bumble has always been from day one, you know, been more than just a dating app in, in my mind, personally. I've, from the very first moment Bumble was kind of agreed to, you know, be, be built or created even under a different name, it wasn't even Bumble at the time, it stood for something bigger than whatever even it is today. And so I still think there's such runway and I think there's a message here for anyone that does want to start a company. Don't just think about, like you said, the tactical, like, okay, the, the product works this way, A, B, and C. It's like, who is this person? If this product was a person, who are they? Do they make you feel good about yourself? Do they leave um, positivity everywhere they go? Or is it negative? Is it toxic or is it kind? Is it safe or is it dangerous? And you know, I, I just really think companies have personalities and spirits and there's like a soul to these brands. And so be thoughtful about it, right? I, was obsessed with every little detail of the branding on day one because that stuff matters. It's like the code of its existence for the next however many, hopefully, you know, dozens and dozens of years to follow. I love it. I now I I love that notion of like I don't know if I thought about it that way of like if this were a person like what would Who it is be it? like? I love that. Um, are there examples, of, like tactical examples, I guess, of just like, as an example at Stitch Fix, like I feel like we would try to say like, let's look at everything through the lens of our values, which is maybe a, slight, a slightly different take, but and it's like, how would performance reviews be done differently? Or how would this be done differently? And like, what are some of those for Bumble? What are the things that like, you know, y that you do things in a way that like only Bumble could do it? Yeah, so I, our tagline at our ink level is kind connections. And um, I, to your point, I think, asking ourselves a new product feature or a new marketing campaign, is this kind connections? Is it actually that? Or is it something else that we're trying to make fit here? And I do think this will be the beginning of kind of a broader decision-making process that we run, which is if it's not kind connections, just don't do it. And anybody here can apply that to any business they start. Mm -hmm. Whether it's, uh, you know, it could, quite literally, it could be any business in the world. Having that simplistic, whether it's a mission or a tagline or an ethos, whatever you're going to subscribe to and just say, is it actually this, right? Is it actually organic? Is it actually X, Y, or Z? And so I think it's really important. And to your point, you probably make changes all the time. You're like, oh wait, this isn't in line with our values or this could be more in line with our values. And yeah. it, kind of keeps you on the track. Totally, and I love that, I mean, you're even, trying to figure out what you're not gonna do, I feel like is actually one of the hardest parts of mm -hmm. like being an entrepreneur and someone who has lots of ideas and lots of exciting things. Mm -hmm. And so I love even using it as like, okay, like let's use this as a lens to figure out what we're not gonna do. Yes, yes, I think process of elimination through mission, through who you want to be is really strong because I think you, you and I are in very similar boats. When we have this type of scale, the world is literally your oyster. You can work with anyone, you can team up with any brand, you have access beyond you know, our early founding wildest <laughs> imagination. And so I think when you're starting your company, it's like, what can we do, what can we do? We'll do anything, we'll take anything that we can get. And now it's really about being extremely protective and very, um, very precise about what not to do. Yeah. Right? Because the the to-do stuff will just run a huge list. Totally. 
And on the to-do side, I mean, what are some of the things that you're working on that you're excited about, things that you want everybody to sign up for besides just signing up for yeah. Bumble in general? Um, so I was very sad in the last class that we were just in. Um, I asked everybody who had a Bumble profile, and it was not as many people as I would have liked. So try this again. <laughs> How many people in this room are on Bumble? OK, this is better. Still <laughs> broadly anchored over here, so I'm not sure if they're doing this to be polite, because they're closer to me. But everybody needs to download Bumble. And Bumble BFF, right, Beth? So Bumble BFF, for those of you that are not looking for romantic connections, um, friendship is something we all need. And that really is a big focus of mine in 2023. I think everybody here, probably on a personal level or on a more macro level understands how serious loneliness is right now. Um, I think we've seen the devastating reports that you know, teen girls, one in three of them, have had um, very serious mental health struggles with social media and all of that. So I think my 2023, the things I'm excited about to the point that you were just talking about is what is Kind Connections? How does that come to life further? So how do we safety by design every single thing in our product. I mean, there should not be one thing that we do at Bumble that is not safety by design, inclusivity by design. The gender conversation is huge for mm -hmm. us. I mean, think about it. We started a company where women make the first move. This was in 2014 when Me Too had not happened, Time's Up had not happened. There was no conversation around gender. It was really early, and so I think 2023 is about What's the next iteration of that beyond this kind of binary women go first um, product offering and furthering our um, efforts around legislation? So in tw 2019, we passed our first law, um, which makes sending unsolicited lewd images illegal. Um, it's now actually illegal in California, Texas, several other states, and we're working on the federal version of that. So also looking at AI, right? AI is happening. It's going to be a, a bigger part of our business. I'm sure it's a huge part of your business already. How do we keep that from being harmful mm -hmm. towards women and marginalized communities? And so really just being obsessed with engineering kind connections into everything we do and then um, you know, really making sure that Bumble BFF scales into this friendship space that we think is enormous and I love you know that. a lot of other things but trying to stay sane yeah I love that no I think I mean this I, I love the concept of investing in friendship and I think it is such in this moment in time it's like it's always important but it's just like more important than ever and who better to lead it than you I you <laughs> are better <laughs> to lead it probably <laughs> but no we're you know we're doing the best we can every day and um, how, how, I'm actually very curious about AI in your world. I like how you're trying to turn the tables here. You're on the This is a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a monologue. So um, I'm actually very curious about AI. Is, has that already been a huge piece of how you serve, you know? All yeah, these? I mean, it's so interesting because um, I, yeah, like it has, so many people now are talking about just from chat GPT and generative AI and just like so many people now are talking about like in our world, everybody's talking about, well, what's your AI strategy and whatever. And I mean, it's interesting because Stitch Fix in some ways has been an AI strategy it from has. the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a stylist. It's like a, you know, it's, and, and there, now there's like more formal words for all of these, but it's like, you know, human in the loop with AI and machine learning. And so that's always been what we've done. Um, and so it's, it's interesting because in some ways it commoditizes what we've been, what we consider to be one of our core capabilities. And so in some ways that can be a little scary, oh, I guess. I but on the other way. side, it's actually really exciting because it suddenly just makes like so much. We spent, you know, we, we had 150 data scientists working on things that now you could just kind of plug and play and use yeah, we have the so we it's have an efficiency. It's thing. more efficient, and I think that the valuable thing is the data set, which you guys have too, right? Like I think you can, it's garbage in, garbage out with data. Like you know, a model needs a data set that's really actionable and really accurate and helpful. Mm -hmm. And so like we still have this proprietary data set, and we've already built a lot of things on it. And I think actually a lot of what's happening.
happening in AI now is actually going to help us to like move faster, I think, in some ways. Yeah. But um, but it's interesting because there are things like like we already had like a guided stylus note, so the stylus could um, like you know so we could help the stylus with memory as an example, where it's like hard if a stylus is working with the same client for a long time to remember something that happened nine fixes ago, and like we can surface that kind of stuff. And so we had already kind of started doing some things like that. Um, that now I think in some cases we don't have to home grow all of the AI development yeah. that we've been doing and that we can plug in. And so, <clears throat> but it's interesting. It's a very interesting conversation that we have because like now, and, and one thing on the public side that's actually really helpful is that I do feel like there are times when I, and there are people in the public markets who would kind of be like, these 150 data scientists, like, but what do they really do? Like, right. does this now like really help your business or not? And like now people like get it. And, mm -hmm. um, and so that's, so, you know, so largely I think it benefits our business and it's really exciting that I think something we've been excited about for 11 years is like now something that the general public's excited about. But yeah, I think it's very validating. And also your brand is front and center with this. So I actually think there's an opportunity for the public to actually understand what Stitch Fix power and superpower is in a more tangible way, yes. because you know, to to that you know kind of um, average consumer out there, AI would have been such foreign language right. last year, and so I think this is probably really helpful. It's interesting. In addition to, I mean, in addition to AI, what are some of the other like really big picture themes of things that you're seeing that are kind of changing the business landscape, or things that are that you're thinking about in terms of like the long term strategy of yeah. Bumble? Um, so I think we think about our business in kind of three key buckets, which is our dating products, right? So that's Bumble Date, the one that you all know and will have on your phone today. Um, so that's that <laughs> product, Fruits, Badoo. And then our next bucket is really um, kind of build or buy strategy. So what is out there that we could buy that is um, you know, additive to the relationship mm -hmm. environment? Not even just a core dating product, but what, what extends that user um, life cycle, what adds back to the Bumble ecosystem. And then the third category is um, really kind of this foray beyond love. So Bumble BFF is our prime example. Biz is still there, but it's kind of taking a back seat to BFF at the moment. And then really anything that we can kind of use around kind connections, mm -hmm. um, but platonically, and you can imagine that can extend into a lot of different verticals. But I think really just being obsessed with our customer and letting them lead us as well, I think there's a huge opportunity around breakups. You know, a lot of people come back to Bumble after they've gone through something tough. So how can Bumble have your back, not necessarily AI necessarily start to finish, but have this kind of kind bebot of sorts that can have your back through all of your relationships, right? Through finding friends, through navigating nights out with your friends, to going on first dates, to making your profile better after you've gone through a breakup and you're feeling a little insecure, all the way to finding your business opportunities and maybe, you know, starting your company. Um, and then the, the kind of the next step. So what can we do with success stories? Mm -hmm. There's such an opportunity. I mean, I get tagged in Bumble weddings I every love day. When you repost those. And it's like, you know, <laughs> the wedding planners are integrating Bumble into all their weddings. And so there's just a lot of different adjacencies. And I think it's a good message for anybody that wants to start a business is what's the LTV of your customer and where can you go with your customer beyond your core offering? Because sometimes, maybe 10 years from now, that will be more interesting than our core dating product. Who knows? Yeah. Okay, I see Graham up All here right, hovering. Yeah, we're gonna, are we're are you move, cutting us off? We'll move to Q&A. <laughs> and if, if, so if you have a question, raise your hand. We have a number of runners who are going to run the mics to you. But before we do that, let's give uh, Whitney and Christina a good one. Thank you. You're the best. Um, where's, our, where's our mic runners? Okay, there you go. All right. Um, thank you so much for speaking with us. It's, it's really a privilege to hear from someone who's just had such an impact on advancing equality for women. Um, so question for you, what do you think the next phase of dating will look like and how do you think it's gonna impact gender dynamics between men and women? Great question. Uh, so I think we are in the swipe era right now, right? So when I somehow landed in this dating land, um, we were in the match eHarmony era where you, in order to online date, you had to um, 
be a certain degree of creepy at that point, <laughs> um, perceived yeah, as perceived by society standards. And you had to fill out crazy forms, digital forms. Like you had to essentially hand over your blood type to figure it out. And then, you know, when we launched Tinder, it kind of threw all of that out the window and was like, who's right here around you? You get to see photos and you say yes or no. And we all saw the you know, consequences, good and bad, of that. Um, and then when I launched Bumble, it was really like, wait a second, even through all of these dating phases, the woman has been completely ignored in all of this. And women are treated like second-rate citizens offline and online in the digital uh, dating and offline dating world. So it was all about women. And now I think we're moving into this space of people really wanting to connect beyond just looks um, and want to, people want to have that magic moment, that lock eye moment, but I don't think we're gonna get rid of our phones and I don't think we're gonna go back to, you know, just waiting for that perfect person to sliding door style walk in front of us. So I think it's going to be a hybrid of how do we make online dating more trusted, safer, more accountable, and two, how do we let people's personality um, and kind of intangible beyond a screen shine through. Um, and so I think if you can imagine the innovation around those two opportunities, I think that's the next level of everything. So pro-social behavior, a lot of more accountability, safety, um, kind of women first approach, but in a way that feels more, um, more personal than just a photo. Sorry, that's probably really vague, but that's all I can tell you. <laughs> Thank you both so much for your time. Um, Whitney, you have spoken earlier about how when people underestimate you, you use that as an opportunity. In previous um, interviews, you had also talked about how when you receive a no, rather than being disappointed, you use that to be motivated. Um, what are ways that you've trained your mind to have this type of positive grit when facing rejection? Ooh, great question. Um, you know, I, I think it's very simple. You have to believe in yourself. You have to. Even when others are unwilling to and even when you struggle to do it, it has to start with you. It's so easy for everyone around you to dismiss you. So we have to be our own biggest advocate. We have to. And it's funny, you know, I'm in this business of relationships, but candidly, the most important relationship we've got is the one with ourselves. And so, you know, let everybody around you tell you no. Let everybody around you not believe in you. That's okay. If you become so strong in yourself, which by the way, I'm not always strong in myself, right? Like there are days where I have zero belief in myself. But that's part of it. You have to have compassion as well for, for those feelings. So I think it all starts with just believing in yourself and letting, you know, let everybody else follow. That's what makes a real innovator. And so I think, you know, you just got to let everybody do their own thing. You can't control them, only you. Hi, thank you so much for coming in and speaking with us. I'm Emily. Hi. Um, I really loved what you said about how the business is the people and how you craft like a personality for Bumble. I'm curious how you... Um, came up with your strategy for hiring and specifically maybe young talent, the people right at the beginning that were making Bumble what it would be, and now also after going public and obviously managing so many people who make up Bumble? Yeah, um, great question. So I think early on, and not to make her feel awkward because she will feel awkward when I do this, but Caroline, who's in the front row, she is my first hire ever at Bumble. So she's a big part of the DNA of the company. And I think when I met Caroline, I could see values and attributes in her that I would want to see in the company. Kind, thoughtful, hardworking. Um, she was just kind of the perfect blend of a good human. And so I really tried to just look for good humans that had potential. So actually, it's interesting, a lot of the folks that I hired early on, um, they would not have gotten jobs off of LinkedIn. Like no one would have hired them based on a series of just random criteria. 
But my God, when you spoke to them and when you just got in their mind for two minutes, you're like, you have so much potential. So I think really looking for potential beyond just resume is so important early on. But you need a hybrid, right? You have to have the resume for a lot of these real kind of more structured roles, whether it's legal or finance, whatever. And then as you scale, I think you don't want to swing the pendulum 100% one way or another. You know, It's still really important to me that we hire people that bring the magic, even if they're not you know, 30 years tenured at 20 amazing companies. Like You need a blend. And so I think you, know, you just have to kind of deal with the needs of the business as it goes. I mean, Katrina, I'm sure you've dealt with this all along. I mean, you have to have... You have to strike that right balance because too many professional people will kill the magic. This is the truth. Too many smart people ruin things. No, seriously. You have to have some people that are willing to just operate off of a gut, and then you need the really smart people to keep them in check. I don't know who's calling on who. I, I, I don't. It's me. I'm going to ask the question. Um, thank you so much for being here today. And my question is two parts. So who are some of the mentors or the role models that you looked up to when you first started your Bumble journey? And my second question is, now as a successful entrepreneur, what are some ways in which you're supporting or bringing in more women into the tech and business space? Um, so Katrina, <laughs> and I, I, like, I know that's like an easy thing to point to the person asking you questions, but no, really, truly, Katrina was the role model for me. I mean, reading your articles, seeing your stories, like, I could do it because you did it. And you did it in such a way that I was like, oh my God, like, I'm inspired. It makes you want to run faster. You have to have a role model to be able to make it. You know, you have to. And the sad reality is, as much as I'd love to say there was a thousand Katrinas, there wasn't. I mean, you were the one and only. And so, um, you know, Katrina still, to this day, you still are my role model. I'm like very, you know, shocked that I get to be on a stage with you. I, I mean that sincerely. Like, I really admire you. And um, I think you've been an incredible example of giving back because she did not have to take my call when we were going public. She did not have to respond to me. Um, she's busy. She's a lot going on, but you were so willing to, and you were so humble and so generous with your time. And I think that's something I would like to be better about because I get caught up in the like, I have all these high priorities in the day and I have these kids that need me. Like I don't have time for 15 minutes with this person trying to start a company and I have to stop doing that. And I'm really trying to get into, um, actually have carved out one day a month on a Friday where it's a free day, but it's not a free day for me. It's a free day for people that want mentoring. You do a sensational job of this. She does on her Instagram. You should all follow along. But I do think like you just have to make time because it's easy once you've made it past these hurdles to just like keep going forward. And I think you have to continue to go backwards to help the next people along the way. So thank you for inspiring me to do that. And oh, I'm thanks. going to do a better job of that. Well, it goes both ways. And I um, I mean, I so admire everything you've done. And it's funny because now I feel like you were calling me about public. Now I call you Bill, my, um, Bill Gurley on my board recently. I told Whitney this, like, l like sent me their earnings call. It was like, you should listen to this. And these are all the things that I thought were awesome about it that you should borrow. And so um, it's really That's cool to have the crazy. tables turned. Um, and the one thing I would just add to it, just because I do feel like the public narrative around it is so different, is that like my experience of the women that we get to reach out to and connect with as mentors is that it is like a thousand percent people helping each other. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's this kind of like nasty narrative around like women being super competitive or blah, 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 that like I feel really lucky that I haven't experienced. And I really do think like, you know, we all, I, I have felt so supported and so felt like people are going above and beyond. And I know you feel like it's, it never feels like it's enough, but just know that like, you know, I know that you've given back in those ways too. And I do like, I think it is one really special part about kind of the community that we get to be part of, albeit it's way too small, but I do feel like it's one that like I've really appreciated how yeah. supportive people have been. Power of female friendship. Mm -hmm. It's really important. Um, no, I agree with you. I think that's, that's absolutely right. Hi, I'm 
I'm Shane. Thanks so much for coming. I'm right here. Sorry. Hi. I'm like, oh, these lights are blaring. <laughs> I, know, I can't see where anything's good. Um, I'm curious, like, I think some would say that something that's really unique about your product is if you do your job really well, then potentially you would be on the app for a short period of time, which I know not every relationship is like that, but let's say in a typical one. So I just wonder, like, how you think about that problem of, like, success means that actually, like, potentially less engagement. Yeah. So, honestly, a fantastic question. It's the first question that every investor asked me when we were going public. So the day we were wireframing Bumble, I wrote several words on a board, but one of them was churn. And churn is um, a guaranteed part of a dating app. You're going to have churn. But how could we tweak this and make it super positive? And how can we churn, turn churn into our marketing engine? So beforehand, if you met on a dating app, people were like, we can lie and say we met at a coffee shop. So I wanted to make sure that that was not the case. And so if you met on Bumble, that became the best marketing for us. So now at a wedding, if there's Bumble stuff everywhere because they met on Bumble, like I can't pay to get into your wedding. Like I don't know how to do that from a marketing and perspective. And it happens so, all the time. It's no, amazing. It does. And so this churn actually, you lose one to gain five because yes, you lost a match because they met each other and they had such a great time and now they're you know never going to use the dating app again. But now they've told all their friends and they've validated it in their micro communities, which is super powerful. The second piece of that is the LTV story around Bumble the brand. We were kind of talking about that earlier. Bumble BFF, these adjacencies, being in your yoga class on the yoga mat. I mean, why would a dating app do that? But we were so particular about this and we just broke through the rules of what we were told we could do for our category because candidly, like love is all we've got, right? And relationships and, and the health of those is all we've got. So I feel like we have permission to play anywhere. That's how I personally feel, but I might be a crazy lady, so who knows. <laughs> Hi there. Oh, is this working? Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Zoe, and I'm a Bumble Honey for campus. And thank you so much for talking. My mom's also like a huge super fan. So like, she right, right now she was like, she was like, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I guess my <laughs> main Mom, question hi. for you um, is, what does Bumble mean to you? And like, on a more personal note, like, how has the creation and like journey of your company affected the way that you see yourself in the broader world, or your relationships, or yeah, just in life? So. Well, hi, hi, mom, wherever <laughs> mom is. Um, thank you for being a Bumble, honey. We love you. Um, I, Bumble saved me. I was a broken human when I started Bumble, completely broken. So sad, going through this Tinder stuff. Um, and I basically just channeled everything I wished there was that I didn't have into this company. Um, I just gave it everything I didn't even know I had in me. Um, and I had only ever had really toxic relationships. My first boyfriend was very, very abusive when I was a young girl, like 15, 16, 17 years old. And I just never wanted that for any other girl out there. I just wanted to fix it. And so I basically just wished upon a star of whatever I wish relationships looked like and tried to just put that into every corner of our business. And so um, engineering kinder connections and trying to make people um, behave better on the internet, like I live for this stuff. So Bumble is me and I am Bumble, which is probably not a good thing. Um, like literally people are like, hi Bumble girl. I'm like, my, I do have a name, but that's okay. Uh, so I think it means everything to me and I, um, I'm excited for what we can do with it next. And I just love that answer because, you know, all of us have had experiences. Like, I think all of us sometimes have this question around, like, do I have the skill set or the background or whatever to be an entrepreneur? We all have experiences. Yeah. And some of them might not be great experiences in our life that you can actually learn from and be able to create into something that's going to positively impact people in the future. And so I just, I love ending on that. I think it's so inspiring. You're the best, and thank you for doing this. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah, Whitney, Katrina, thank you so much for spending time. You have, there's so many things you could be doing. So really